Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our third week of Crop Diagnostic School, where we are here as your ARD panelists to answer your questions from the field. Um, today, we have our normal panelist group. We have one substitute in today that you will recognize. Uh, Rajan Picard is covering for Ann Kirk, who couldn't be here today, and so he will be answering your cereals questions. Okay, so first question that we are getting in, um, and Dane, this is going to be a question for you, and it's regarding um, flax. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had a question that came in asking about flax crop, an area of flax crop that was dying. There was no in-crop herbicide applied and no fertilizer was seed placed. Um, there are fla flax plants at various stages, breaking off at the base, they're wilted, they're dying, but plants right next to it are still okay. Is this fusarium wilt? Uh, haven't had flax growing on this field for the past seven years. Uh, used certified seed this spring, like what might be going on here? Well, it's interesting we mentioned fusarium wilt. That is not likely the case in this, and I'm confident in saying that right off the hop because of such a long rotation, because most flax varieties contain uh, at least moderately resistant genetics to fusarium wilt. Uh, so that rules out a lot of that. We haven't had the favorable weather, the moisture, the, the warmth for that disease to develop. And sort of using certified seed means it's a lot cleaner to begin with. Uh, so fusarium wilt should be lower on, would be lower on my radar, but having random plants that are dying um, and we can rule out herbicide and we can rule out um, seed placed fertilizer injury. We're, I really want to look at the seeding date on that flax and the seeding depth. Um, I've seen an, quite a number of fields, oilseed crops have some odd looking symptoms in the past two weeks, uh, largely due to what we found was a combination of extreme temperature changes and the extreme heat wave that we've been facing. So flax seeded May say mid May, it's a little bit of a slower growing crop. Made it to that second or that first week of June, that June second to fifth, somewhere in there where we had those extreme temperatures. We had those 40 degree days. Um, we had soil within the top inch reaching also almost 40, 50 degrees in some cases. And we might see heat canker developing on flax stems, we would, or, or, or flax canola, even sunflowers to some extent where those crops were burnt and blistered by extremely hot soils we found that those stems are weakening they're pinching off and in the strong winds that followed in subsequent days without a lot of follow-up moisture those stems got weak they fell over and as a result we're seeing wilted flax that looks smaller because the flax beside it now has grown and become taller uh, so that is a, a fairly key indicator there in that instance uh, so that's what i would suspect, uh, suspect is the issue with a couple missing flax plants. Now, hopefully there's enough stand there to achieve a good yield potential, um, but that will require some plant counts. Thanks, Dane. Um, a question came in uh, as well to our question box. And this question is going to be for John Godlowski. Uh, we have had a huge outbreak of alfalfa weevil around the Mendoza area, causing some extreme amounts of damage to stands. Producers are cutting early to help control this, but should we be worried about damage to the second cut or is their life cycle going to be finished by then? With alfalfa weevil, they've got one generation in a year and it's usually the older larvae that do most of the damage. And the whole purpose of early cutting is you're cutting when they're in uh, the stage where they need their most uh, nutrition. And if their food quality deteriorates, if they don't have good food during those older stages, they die. So that's the whole purpose of cutting early is you're trying to either starve them or desiccate them as the, uh, the crop dries out. So if that works well, you should be uh, good to go. Now, the, pro the problem that we've been noticing is uh, that strategy used to be a pretty um, effective strategy because it took long enough for the new growth to come up 
that you had this big period of time where there was just very little food for the alfalfa weevil. Some of the newer um, varieties of alfalfa, the regrowth comes up super quick. And you, I would say still watch that regrowth. We have had cases recently where people have cut early and still had damage to that regrowth. It, so it, watch it is what I'm saying. Uh, the early cutting may work very well for you and that might be the end of the story, but do keep an eye on that regrowth just in case. Okay, and speaking of watching for things, John, I'm gonna keep you on, uh, John G. Uh, because I've been noticing something in my garden and uh, what I've been noticing in my garden is that I've had some grasshoppers showing up. And the fact that I live, uh, you know, on the outskirts of a, of a larger area, but not in the country, I'm a little worried that if I'm seeing grasshoppers, other people are probably seeing grasshoppers too. And so, you know, I people are seeing grasshoppers in the field edge or pasture. There's lots of flowering vegetation. What do I need to worry about? What kind of control options do I have? What do I need to do at this point while I'm kind of seeing these grasshoppers start to increase? Okay, uh, so the, the important thing is to be scouting early for grasshoppers. Um, the hatch should be almost done by now. So the next two to three weeks is really the ideal time to be doing your scouting. And if you've got a heavy population, uh, Again, the next two or three weeks is the ideal time to be doing that control. Now, you mentioned about having flowering vegetation in the area. If you've got any flowering vegetation, that really limits your control options. Um, a lot of the, the pyrethroids are broad spectrum, a lot of the organophosphates. So if you're going to be using them, uh, go as late in the day as you can to try to avoid the pollinators. You've really got three options as far as things that won't harm pollinators and beneficials. Uh, there's two brand baits out on the market. There's Eco brand and there's no low bait. Um, the Eco brand basically is seven coated bait. So Carbaryl or seven is on the bait. So it works fairly quickly on the grasshoppers. Um, and you just have to uh, spread that instead of spray it. That's the maybe the inconvenient part for some. The Nolo bait has a protozoan on it. It is not fast acting. You won't see quick kill. It's something people would use to try to build up a disease in the population over time, but it's not a quick kill. Now, the other semi-selective option is Corrigin. Um, it doesn't harm Hymenoptera, so bees, wasps, things in that um, um, Hymenoptera group. It doesn't really do much to. Uh, it's great on grasshoppers, great on Lepidoptera, so-so on beetles, uh, but doesn't kill uh, a lot of your pollinators. So those are your more selective options. Okay, um, we're gonna switch gears a little bit. Uh, last Can week or two- John, Is it time for you to talk about the Wyoming approach of controlling grasshoppers? You wanna put that idea out there? Yeah, thanks, John. That, yeah, that's actually a good uh, good point. Uh, and especially if you do, if you are concerned about conserving some of the beneficials, uh, what John's referring to, the Wyoming approach, is a technique we call reduced area and agent treatments, or RATs. And what they researched was applying products in strips. So they would spray, now in their experiment, they were doing 100 feet sprayed, 100 feet non-sprayed, et cetera. And they tried different, variations of this uh, 30 feet sprayed and whatever. So, but anyway, you're, you're spraying in strips. And so you're doing uh, anywhere from a third to a half of your, your acres being sprayed. Um, intuitively, you might think 50% control. What they found in their research is they were getting 80 to 90% control, which was just a few percentage less than when they sprayed the whole field. Now they were using products with a little bit of residual. So what was happening, the grasshoppers, they're very mobile, they move around. Uh, that's why you were getting the 80-90% kill and not 50%. So for anyone, who, especially if you're using a more expensive product and you're trying to keep the cost down, or you're concerned about the natural enemies and you just want to reduce the kill, you can do things in strips. Now the research for this was all done on pasture lands. It hasn't been researched in cereal and pulse and forage crops, 
um, aside from pastors. Um, I, anecdotally, I do know people who have been using that in cereals and pulse crops and anecdotally telling me they thought they got good results. But the, the research right now has been with the pastures. Um, so because we often also at Crop Diagnostic School and John uh, Hurd does this too a lot, uh, talk about, you know, in crop testing and uh, strip trials and stuff like that. How would you go about actually trying to quantify whether or not you're seeing that kind of control, John, using that type of um, approach? Yeah, well, the, the way you would need to do that is uh, have some sort of estimate of what the grasshopper densities were like before you went in and applied, and then do a follow-up um, maybe a, a week or more after you've applied, and just compare the, the, the density levels that you're seeing. Excellent, thank you. That was really interesting. <clears throat> um, uh, David uh, Kaminsky, we've got a question for you about dry conditions. Now this le links back to something we've talked about in a previous week, which is fusarium head blight and the risk maps. Um, and so, you know, given the fact that it's been dry and I'm not sure what the risk maps are showing this week, um, what are your thoughts about spraying wheat for head blight, fusarium head blight this fall or this year, sorry? Okay, thanks, Marla. When uh, the Fusarium map, risk map first came out at the beginning of last week, it was alarming. It showed most of the province uh, bright red, which is extreme risk. And I put in a big disclaimer because that was really not the case. Very little of the crop was at a susceptible stage. And uh, it was the model was influenced a lot by three days of rain and the model looks back at the last seven days of rain. You haven't looked this week, but it's gone almost entirely green. And that is because now we have had a period of longer than a week when there's been no significant rainfall. Furthermore, the temperature has dropped out of the ideal range. We're cooling down to less than 10 degrees overnight. And uh, Anita Brule babel who's done a lot of work with Fusarium, as a thumb rule, that if it's going below 10 at night, there's very little, if any, fusarium risk because you're not getting the heat and humidity coincidence that you need for infection. So I've had uh, some agronomists calling me and saying they're asking their producers to hold off or their producers are saying, I don't think it's right to be spraying fungicide for head blight right now. And I think that's closest to the truth. Now I am seeing spring cereals in my travels that are already out of the boot and on the verge of flowering. Those are the most advanced ones uh, down here in the valley. I don't know what other people are seeing, but um, yeah, we're just getting there. Now winter cereals have headed and flowered. And uh, so for the most part, that's water under the bridge. Did I answer all of the points of that question? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, it's mostly um, asking about, you know, uh, basically, or what are we seeing and whether or not we should be spraying, um, given the risk being now low again. Um, and that's a good thing that maybe the map is showing a more accurate display of what's going on this week. Um, well, Marla, if I could yeah. jump in there a little yeah. bit on the, on the disease train. Um, We've had the similar conversations with some agronomists around sclerotinia in canola at this time. Uh, David, do you want to enlighten us a little bit more on that? I know canola is a little bit further away from flowering, but we have seen some fields that are stress bolting now and putting out uh, blooms maybe earlier than they would. Do, do, do those same risk factors present themselves for sclerotinia in canola? I got on mute. No, you hear me? Um, yeah. Yes, Dane, there is some commonality. Um, you really can't have infection starting before uh, petals are falling. They provide the sugar source for the spores that are germinating. Uh, and you also need free moisture to launch an attack. Um, I have seen quite a number of fields that are in the early stages of flowering. But as you say, it's premature bolting and the canopy is still wide open. So there's very little chance that those first petals that are falling um, present a risk. Furthermore, 
Um, we don't have the conditions that are right for Apothecia to form and be shooting ascospores right. around to, to spread and infect plants. So I think for the most part, um, there isn't any risk for crops right now. And we'll have to see how dense the canopy gets and how much significant moisture we get over the next seven to 14 days. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. A um, couple questions here coming in for Kim. And Kim, I'm, I think you're on. I know we can't see your screen yeah. because your webcam hasn't been working properly. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so two two things that are coming up here. One, um, drift, roundup drift into my dry beans. And so if a na I have a neighbor who's drifted roundup on my dry beans, talked to him already, says the damp, but he says the damage isn't too bad. Um, what's my next step since I think that there's actually more damage there? Um, okay, thanks, Marla. Uh, yeah, the next step, I guess the first thing to do is obviously talk to the farmer and you've done, the person's done that already. And um, if they, you want to pursue, take it further because you think there is damage, um, you can contact us. I can get you in touch with Sarah, um, our pesticide person, and she, we have a form that can be filled out and it kind of details how you need to go about um, documenting everything and normally once the two farmers have talked to each other then their insurance companies get involved um, hopefully everybody has liability insurance most of the big farmers or most farmers will have some type of liability insurance and usually then at that point the insurance companies will will take over um, so but we do have a form that is available that kind of helps you kind of go through the steps and the big thing too is to document everything um, if you think there's been drift already and you haven't sprayed your crop yet then please get in there and get some you know do some assessments before you get in there to spray yourself um, because then that just kind of compounds the issue um, but definitely everybody's got cell phones take pictures with your cell phones they've got the date and time on them and that type of thing and um, try to monitor what's going on and what's been damaged and you know there's not a lot you can do once it's been damaged i am not a fan of spraying um products on to try to decrease stress and this and that especially like not a not it's not something from spray drift um but so i'm not really a fan of, of trying some of those things i really don't think that those work so at that at this point you just need to document everything and again start talking to your insurance company and uh, they will take it from there and not a fun situation to be in but unfortunately it's probably a situation that we see more often than we would like mm -hmm. um and good advice there kim thank you for that uh Another question for you, and this is um, some people are talking about seeing striping showing up in some cereals, and is this a carryover from group two? So I guess the question then is like, how do I diagnose when I'm seeing group two carryover? Uh, yeah, it can be group two carryover, and we are seeing it in other crops as well as the striping in cereals. And it does start to show up about now, maybe a little bit later this year than normal, but usually by June, we start to see it. So lots of times with herbicide residue, the plants will, your crop will come up quite nicely and quite normally, but as it starts to get bigger, um, all of a sudden it seems to find the residue or we've got a bigger root system and it's rooting into more soil. It gets to a certain stage, like I said, usually by that mid early to mid June sometimes, and all of a sudden we start to see these symptoms show up. So you do need to rule out that it's not a spray drift because that is possible. And sometimes we end up having both on the same fields, which is really fun to try to, to, try to diagnose. Um, but then you start looking at history and we are definitely seeing some group two carryovers this year. So you're gonna see them mostly like on, in the poor areas of the field. So your eroded knolls, a lot of it has to do with pH. And we know when we lose topsoil off those knolls, um, then we're into the subsoil, which has a higher pH. Is usually less organic matter in that subsoil as well so it's kind of a double whammy in that case got a usually higher ph and lower organic matter but the biggest thing and if you, you look at uh, quite a few of the labels they'll actually have specific um rainfall um, requirements in the year of application so that was last year 
And um, it, when these uh, herbicides were applied, when you look at the recropping restrictions on them, a lot of times the recropping restrictions will have um, an asterisk or some type of a note that talks about pH and organic matter and um, having adequate moisture. And the biggest thing is not adequate moisture. We did not have anywhere near a normal year last year for moisture. So the herbicides didn't break down like they should have. And in that case, um, we do see more carryover than we would expect to see. But uh, like, like I said, there is disclaimers on some of the labels that talk about that. Um, you can't make it rain and we certainly couldn't make it rain last year. It just takes time to break it down. From here on in, will it be all right? It, it depends, every case is different. There might be plants that don't recover. Lots of times too, with a group two, you'll see yellowing, uh, you'll see striping um, on your cereals. Sometimes it's a bit of a red color. With broad leaves, you'll see usually yellowing, especially of the growing point, and you'll get the growth will pretty much stop. And uh, if you have areas of the field that maybe didn't get sprayed or you have an adjacent field that's very similar, you'll be able to kind of compare them. But the problem with a lot of this is even if the plants recover, it does slow them down um, and they kind of stop growing for a little while and then they 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 might get going again, but it, it does delay them. So. Another place to watch too is your headlands, uh, any place where you've had overlap, any place where you've been turning, that type of thing. With GPS, we have very little overlaps like we used to have, but there might be some, so you might be able to pick up those strips in the field as well. So your double application rates, and then also um, where in the areas of the field with the, the higher pH and the lower soil organic matter, that's where I'd be looking for it the most. I love that you start talking about eroded knolls and eroded areas as being an issue because of course that's near and dear to my heart so um but uh we can get into that in another another day when we start talking about landscape restoration and other ways that we might be able to manage those areas uh but it takes a little bit of effort to uh to kind of fix those eroded areas um, mm -hmm. which can have a lot of benefits in the long run in terms of decreasing some of these risk areas a comment i guess it's more of a comment came in um that leaf tipping, leaf tips are showing up or tipping is showing up in wind damaged areas. Um, so, you know, we might be seeing true striping. We might also just be seeing some of these impacts on the tip of the leaf. So being able to, does anybody have a comment that they want to make around being able to kind of see where the, the leaf is actually damaged uh, to determine what that damage then might be caused by? Um, I'd like to hear John Hurd's take on it, just because I know we might be misdiagnosing maybe some nutrient deficiencies with the dry conditions. We have had rain, but overall we are still very dry. So I'm wondering, John, um, what would be some lookalike symptoms from that, like that we'd be seeing on our cereals, like the striping or the leaf, the edge burning, that type of thing. Yeah, you're too cruel, Kim. Uh, you're pointing out my boo-boo from last year. Yes, I was out and I misdiagnose some copper deficiency which we uh, often see in wheat as a characteristic pigtailing or burning of the tips easily confused i like to say now easily confused with uh, weather stress and wind damage and so i i pointed out my fallacy in old age by simply doing tissue testing and diagnosing it that way uh, and i've been out seeing a bunch of these and uh, another boo-boo last week, I said, this is zinc deficiency in this striped corn. No, the, the, the tissue test showed it was sulfur deficiency. So the older I get, the less good I am at diagnosing visual deficiency symptoms. And I rely more and more on the laboratory to uh, be the truth serum that we need. And that'd be my encouragement for agronomists too. Uh, before you pull the trigger with another spray, uh, get a test done uh, and uh, we can get quick turnaround. And then if it is with micronutrients, the fix is generally fairly rapid. So we, we have options. Um, no fair, Kim, I don't like it that you pick on the old guy, but anyway, um, I'm sure no, I'm just on that too. Well, I, but I'm just thinking too, from my perspective, um, if we think we're coming into something where we might have some drift or we might have some residue, I'd like to rule out those other things as well. I mean, we lots of times do have compounding issues on some challenging soils. Um, some of the lighter soils, they're dry. We've been dry for a few years now. So we, we may have compound issues. And I think uh, there's no reason to not do a tissue test. Easy to do. 
I've always had uh, great luck with the ag I, I, don't need your pity. I don't need your pity. Let's, yeah. let's move on. Okay. Yeah. Is, there love is, there I, time for, is there time for another old guy to get a word in about striping and wheat? Yes, uh, go for it, John G. Okay. I think that all the old men should be allowed to speak today. Okay, very good. So um, the, the one thing we're noticing in mainly the eastern part of the province is some long white streaks in the upper leaves of the plant. And if you look really carefully, there's a tiny little oily looking blob uh, near that uh, streak. Uh, that's cereal leaf beetle. Um, if they, they wear their feces on their back, that's why they're oily. If you rub that off, they're yellow. And regardless, they leave these uh, white streaks on the leaves. Uh, if you do see that, First of all, note that it's cereal leaf beetle. Secondly, give me a call because uh, we've been releasing parasites for this insect. They're doing a great job, but we're trying to determine what the levels of parasitism is in different areas of the province. So uh, we've got a few samples already, but we need lots more. So if you're seeing that type of white streaking in, in wheat, uh, please give us a call. Give me a call and we'll collect the sample and look for parasites in them. So lesson being always try to figure out striping is not striping for one reason or in like it's there's many different reasons that striping can be occurring and again this is one of the reasons why we're here to answer these questions when people are seeing these things show up in the field um, and a lot of times and john it's not just john heard it's not just because you're old uh, tissue testing is still a good thing to be able to verify what you're seeing as the reason you're what you're expecting to see um, even though you might not actually be guessing correctly anymore. Um, so a uh, question also has come in here about see seeing things in cereals, um, whiteheads and fall rye. And so Rajan, I'm going to have you comment on this one. Um, we've talked in previous weeks that this could be stem maggot. John G has talked about it. And in that case that you would expect that you can pull the head out and it should detach easily. But seeing some fields where there's these white heads and you go and you tug and they're not coming up easily, what might be going on? Yeah, I've noticed that as well in some fall right? Not all of them are necessarily have been uh, impacted by that. But I guess if we remember back in late May, third week of May or so, we had a fairly severe frost, especially mostly north of number one, closer to Lake Manitoba was down to I think minus seven or so, it was quite cold. Uh, around Somerset here where I am, south central Manitoba, we had maybe minus one and a half or so, but it lasted for almost 10 hours. So it was a long frost. And so uh, uh, again, it, it varies from field to field, but yeah, frost can be, and at that point, I guess the fall ride usually tends to emerge or head out by late May, usually it is what I find my, from experience. Uh, this year was a little bit later, but again, so that uh, that, that head, that uh, tender head was uh, in that stem elongating and probably got some exposure to frost. And so that can be a, that can be a cause for a, a, the head when it emerges, it'll be either completely white or part, partially white. So it's, uh, it can vary. Not every head will show symptoms necessarily. I've seen, I've seen a, a sprinkle of that, but I've also seen more of a, uh, almost uh, the whole field can be impacted to some extent there. So, so that can also be a factor impacting. You mentioned that the wheat stem maggot can also, yeah. And so when you pull the head on those frost impacted heads, once you try and pull that and tug on that head, it won't come out because it's, it's still attached uh, properly to, uh, to the rest of the structure of the plant. But uh, in the case of wheat stem maggot, it's uh, John DeBlossi maybe can comment more on that, but it's, it's an insect feeding at the base, just above the, the upper node there. And when you tug on it, the, the, the tissue has been damaged and it's gone. So it, it, uh, it completely comes off. So yes, yeah, so that can be another factor here. Frost can be an issue as well, yes. Any additional comments, John G, that you wanna make? I think Rajan covered it well. There's always an insect uh, uh, possibility with almost anything as well. Uh, but yeah, Rajan covered it well. The, uh, we do have two cycles with wheat stem agate. Uh, this is the early cycle we're seeing now. There's a, a later one, uh, which is usually not as um, severe. Um, with wheat stem agate, it's usually very patchy. We, we very rarely see 
very large swaths of crop with white heads. It's usually very patchy. So a situation where you're seeing um, consistently uh, large areas with white heads is more likely something else. And that um, is another reason why you want to get out in the field and actually diagnose what's going on, that you can't just tell one versus the other by just driving by and, and seeing the field from a distance. And so I know that there's probably more that we could add on some of these comments. I think uh, likely the crop pest report, if you stay tuned for that, some more of uh, information will um, stick around that way. And uh, I, oh, John, G, uh, John Hurd, you have, you're waving your hand. Uh, my, long, my long winded colleagues uh, cut Dennis out of this one. Uh, Dennis has got stuff to talk about on peas, some problems with nodulation and peas. And so if, you, if, if you're not going to give Dennis time, Dennis, I'd encourage you to show it up in crop talk tomorrow or in the crop pest because uh, there's some attention to be paid to the pea crop. Some of my long-winded colleagues need to leave Dennis some time next week. Dennis, do you, we can, we've still got a couple minutes here, Dennis, if you want to comment on pea nodulation. But you got to unmute first. Oh, he is. He might be having some technical difficulties. Okay. Well, given that, then we're going to start off with pea nodulation next week, John Hurd. Thank you. Um, so stay tuned uh, for next week, um, where you're going to learn a lot more about peas than the and from Dennis. Um, and other things I want to comment on quickly as we're wrapping up. One, again, I already mentioned to stay tuned for the crop, te uh, crop pest report. Crop reports come out uh, later today as well. And the other thing that I wanted to mention too is that if you are attending um, the uh, crop talk on Wednesdays, we often are, we're on the panel again on Wednesdays, so that's tomorrow at nine o'clock. So if anybody is looking for more information or hasn't already signed up for Crop Talk, uh, it's a great opportunity to do so. You can go to the government website and just Google Crop Talk and the uh, site, uh, webpage will come up with a link in order to register. So thank you again for your attention and your questions this week. And we will see you guys next week for your fourth installment of Crop Diagnostic School. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Yeah.